Okay, so today's message is going to be a continuation of last week's. Just to rehash a little bit of last week, um, and especially for those of you who are joining us for the first time today, and may not have been here for part of that. Um, I took you through a cycle, a cycle of sin that we have been in and been caught in since sin entered the world, basically. You know, we were going through the story of Cain and Abel, and we can see this cycle through Cain. We studied the sacrifices that they both made to God and read that God accepted Abel's sacrifice and had respect for it, but for Cain's, he did not. And we examined the reasons behind that and it revealed this cycle that Cain took upon himself a cursed occupation, that he chose to be a farmer, and he was a farmer for a long time, put a lot of time into it, put his best works into it, thinking that if he worked hard enough, he could kind of <clears throat> overcome, and God would still accept him in his works. And of course, we see in Scripture that God did not do that. He rejected it. We contrast that with his brother Abel, and we see that Abel, he didn't rely on his works. Abel sacrificed a lamb unto God. And just like Jesus Christ for us today, the blood of the lamb paid the price for him. And that was pleasing to God. He accepted it, and he respected it. So we see this cycle, and we're going to continue with this. We're going to expand upon this because this goes on. So we see that it starts with a decision. If you make a decision inside of God's will, and you hear God's word, and you choose to live by that, or if your goal or your decision is something that you want that's outside of God. And then through a process of time, you come to deceive yourself into thinking that what you're doing is right. And then you work really hard in it. You put your best works and your best efforts, and then you think, God is going to accept what I have, accept what I'm offering for him, to him, accept how I'm living, accept whatever the situation is. And then when you realize that God does not accept it, when you get confronted with the truth and you get, front and can get confronted with the word of God, then you get offended. And we see that with Cain. So we're going to continue this. If you want to read along with me, it's Genesis chapter 4, starting at verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face I shall be hid. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Let's pray. 
Gracious and Heavenly Father, we ask that your spirit will just be with us today. God, I pray that your spirit will be with me. I pray that you will help me to speak your words and not my own. God, I pray that you will open all of our hearts and our minds and help us to truly understand your word. Help us to break it down and examine it and understand this cycle, this cycle of sin, so we can break out of it. Lord, please be with us and speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first thing that we see in uh, verse 8, right after God rejects Cain's sacrifice and God confronts him, he says, why are you mad, Cain? Why is your continence fallen? If thou doest well, don't you know, and I'll accept you. So God confronts him, and after this, it says, And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. It says the very next thing. So they had a conversation. So Cain was already offended. We seen that last time. He was mad. He was mad. His, his countenance had fallen. His expression went south. So he's already in this state of anger when he talks to his brother. And you can imagine how he feels, right? He's sitting there and he is offended and upset because God rejected his sacrifice and rejected what he, how he was living and what he was trying to do. But here his brother is happy as could be because the Lord accepted his sacrifice. Right? His brother is sitting there filled with joy. The blood of the lamb paid my price. I'm good. God accepted my sacrifice. God had respect for my sacrifice. And he's sitting over there just like us when we all come to Christ for the first time. You know, we're so happy. We're so full of joy. We want to shout Jesus' name from the rooftops. We want everybody to feel this feeling, this, this happiness. So this is what Cain or what Abel was doing. So Abel was sitting there, you know, I got the joy, joy, joy. <laughs> but Cain, he was rejected. So see, when you get in conversations like this, we can we can see this and how we deal with the world today. You see, you're in one of two camps. You're either caught in this cycle of sin or you're not. You either have sin in your life and you're living in the world or living for the world. Or the blood of the lamb paid your price, washed you clean, and you're free from this. And now your task is to talk to the people that are trapped. It's one of two options, and we can see this. The Christians of the world, if you're saved, if God has accepted your sacrifices, you are the Abels of the world. And everybody else are the Cains. And we can see that when we talk to the world. The very next thing is, after they get offended, they start to persecute us. The world persecutes Christians. They get mad. They get upset. So you can imagine this conversation because we can imagine this conversation with our own family members. Right? These are brothers right here. They were raised together. They're really close. And Abel, he's full of joy and happy. And Cain's mad. And you can imagine the conversation. You can imagine Abel going, same, same questions God asked him. Why are you mad, Cain? Why are you so upset? And Cain, he's sitting there, well, why are you so happy? I don't want 
hear about your sacrifice. Why didn't God accept my sacrifice? Why doesn't God accept me? Why am I not good enough? He's angry. He's full of wrath. And Abel, he's just going to say, what's wrong, brother? What's wrong? Are you under conviction? Oh, you can imagine how that would go with family. You imagine how that would go with someone in the world, the Cain's of the world. When you confront them, when they're mad, when they're hostile, when they just want to rise up against you, when they want to tear you down and argue with you and say, how dare you? Who, who are you to tell me my sacrifice isn't good enough? Who are you to tell me my decision was wrong? And you respond, what's wrong, brother? Is God convicting you? You got that conviction in your heart of what you're doing? Why, well, that leads to persecution. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Isn't that what the world does? When they are confronted with the truth, when they are confronted with the word of God, when they come in contact with a safe person, with a Christian, with someone filled with the light who's trying to minister to them, who is happy and joyful and has something that they so desperately want, but they don't know how to get. When we have that joy in our life, and when we have that freedom of sin in our life, when God has accepted us and has respect for us, and we are secure in him, and our salvation is secure in him, and the world is looking at us, and they're mad. And they try to shut us up and shut us down. You can see it. See, Cain killed his brother, but it's not even, it's not even that. It's not even just us getting killed Look at all of the ways that Christians are persecuted today. We record all of these videos and put them on YouTube. And if I say the wrong thing, an algorithm, a computer system, flags the video, it gets reviewed, and it can get pulled down. That's just one of many, many ways. That's something small. But it's, it's all the same thing. It's all persecution. It's all silencing the truth. You can imagine Cain picking up a rock and hitting his brother. Cain picking up a rock. Shut up, Abel. I don't want to hear your sacrifice, Abel. I don't want to hear how God accepted you. Why didn't God accept me? Why am I not good enough? Can't you see it in the world today? They just beat us down constantly. This is the cycle. And see, Satan, what he's done, he wants you to think that this is a problem with you. See, Satan has taken the church and he's confused us. He's deceived us. Satan wants us to believe that if we reach this point where we're being persecuted, that we are being mean. See, Satan, he twists the word of God. He, we've seen it just a couple chapters ago when we went over Adam and Eve and the fall of man. What did Satan do? He asked a question and attacked God's word. Did God say you can't eat any of the fruit? No, we can eat of the fruit. We just can't eat of that one tree. Then he says, well, that's not true. See, he attacks the word of God. He twists it. He perverts it. He's doing the same thing. How many times have you Christians heard, well, but love is love. Well, we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. We're supposed to love everybody and accept everybody. And it's hard to, it's almost hard to overcome this. It's hard to argue against it as a Christian because it's a, it's a moral argument. Right? They try to make you out to be a bad person if you don't believe that. But it's a perversion. 
He says he wants you to think if you're being persecuted, you're being mean. You're just using hate speech. You're just a bigot. You're just a racist. You're just, insert the blank. We've all heard it. But I want to share something with you. Let's go to Matthew. Let's see what Jesus says. So Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, he starts this. The very first section. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. With everything that he said here, it's blessed are the poor, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are the meek. He just continues. These are positive things. Right? These are characteristics that Jesus wants to instill in us and that he is going to bless us for. This is part of his identity. And when you get to the very bottom, it's the same wording, it's the same thing, and the same list is blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. But see, Satan has twisted that. Because it's hate speech. And it's bad. And you're a bigot. You're racist. You're whatever. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Is that person mad at you? Eh, not really. They're not mad at what you're saying. They're not mad at you. They're mad at the words you are saying. They're mad at God's spirit within you. You're being persecuted for his sake, for his word. For his truth. And God's going to bless you for it. See, this is what Jesus Christ himself says. And you can contrast that with the world. See, churches, we get so lost. We get caught. We get caught in this trap. We get caught in this trap that Satan has laid for us that we are to love thy neighbor as thyself. And according to Satan, according to the world, that means we are to love everyone and accept them. And we should never speak out against them. We should never do anything. You have churches who hang gay pride flags and so you have Christians who put Black Lives Matter signs in their yard as that same organization is burning down cities and hurting more black people than anybody else in most of those cities but Christians were, were convinced and were told by the world that we're just supposed to accept that The see, James tells us, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So the Bible is very clear, folks. And I want to be very clear 
right? I'm not picking on BLM, right? I'm not picking on homosexuals. I'm not picking on anybody. Because you fall into two camps. You're either lost, and I want to tell you the truth so you can find salvation, or you have salvation, you are a Christian, but you're kind of caught in this cycle too. You've been deceived and convinced that the world, you know, convinced by the world that you're supposed to be okay with this stuff. I mean, scripture is very clear about certain things. I'm not picking on homosexuals, but we also know that clearly from scripture, homosexuality is a sin. So then if we put a pride flag up, what do we become? A friend of the world. When we become a friend of the world, what are we according to scripture? An enemy of God. See, I don't want this for you. I don't want this for me. I'm guilty of this too. I've fallen into this. We have to be very, very careful. And we have to understand that people need the truth. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, let me tell you, I love myself an awful lot. And I'll say that if I trip and fall into a fire, I'm going to get myself out of that fire real quick. <laughs> but when we aren't telling these people the truth, we're not loving them as ourselves. We're holding them down in the fire. So persecution happens. Then let's, let's continue through our Bible verses here. What happens next? He said, uh, Cain rose up and slew his brother. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? You know something peculiar about God? That when God confronts you, he tends to ask a question. Right? We see the same thing with Adam and Eve. He said, Where are you? He continued to ask, you know, he asked Adam, what have you done? Asked Eve, what have you done? See, when God kind of puts that conviction on your heart, it's typically a, a question. This is typically how he works. And it's funny, this contrast between God and Satan, because when, when God asks a question, it's to critique you, but when Satan asks a question, it's to critique God. See, when Satan asks a question, it's to put doubt in you about God. And when God asks a question, he says, why did you doubt me? Why did you not follow me? Why did you not believe me? And it's just inter it's interesting how that, how that works. So God asks a question, where is Abel thy brother? And Cain said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? So this is a very worldly response, too. When people get confronted with God, this is almost an, kind of an agnostic statement. Right? Um, for those of you who don't know, you know, an atheist is someone who strongly believes there is no God. An agnostic is someone who just says, I don't know. I don't know if God is real or not. You know, I don't know if God's word is true or not. I don't really know what I believe. That's this question. It's the same kind of uh, spirit of Cain, if you will. Kind of this way of Cain. And then they typically ask a question back. I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? How am I supposed to know if your word is really true? You see it. You see it in the world. And what does God do? He asks the question right back. He said, what hast thou done? He said, I don't know. How am I supposed to know your word is true? Well, why didn't you know my word was true? Did you study it? 
Did you look at it? Did you ask me about it? Or did you just reject it? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. What does it mean when somebody's blood cries out? He's someone who was persecuted like this. Right? We, we kind of see it a little bit through Scripture. It makes me think of uh, in the book of Acts, um, the Apostle Stephen, right? the first martyr we see in, in Scripture, or in the new church. We see this. See, when Stephen was crucified for his beliefs, for preaching the word of God, was offending people and got persecuted by the world, as he was dying, it says, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin on their charge. And when he, when he had said this, he fell asleep. So he's down to his last breath, this martyr of a Christian, his blood spilt on the ground. And as he's, and he's sitting there and he's giving up this breath, he's still giving glory to God. And that act is still speaking to us today. Blood has power, blood speaks. We know blood has power because of the blood of Jesus Christ. His blood has the power to speak to us, to heal us, to cleanse us. We see that. So the next thing that happens with Cain is he is cursed. That's the next step in this cycle. You reach the point where you're persecuting people, where you're getting offended, and then you're taking up arms against people. God curses you. Now, starting at verse 10, and he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood. So God puts a curse on Cain. Now well, you might be asking, well, what does that mean? Well, the first thing we see, uh, verse 12, When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. So as part of God's curse, he, he cursed the ground, or cursed Cain, and so that whenever he tills the ground, it won't give it its strength. It won't produce for him. Now this is important because if you remember why Cain's actions were evil to begin with, if you remember last week's study, Cain's sacrifice was rejected because his occupation, a farmer, this thing that you know God told Cain's parents, I'm going to curse the ground for you because of your sin, thorns, and thistles will it bring up. You'll have to labor hard in it all the days of your life. Well, Cain said, I'm going to take that up as an occupation. He said, I'm going to work in it. Uh, this is my life's goal. This is what I enjoy. This is what makes my heart happy. I'm going to do this in hopes that God accepts it. Well, God rejected it. And then once it got further on through this cycle, God then cursed that thing that Cain loved so much. He took it from him. He took it away. You see, the book of Hebrews tells us by faith, uh, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And we see this theme throughout Scripture, all through it, is 
whatever you are caught in, whatever sin you are enjoying right now, whatever you are putting above God, that's only for a season. You're only going to find happiness for a little bit, and then God is going to curse you. You're going to struggle. You, know, you may enjoy that fifth of whiskey, and it may feel good right now. You may enjoy it for a season. But if you continue down that path, it will destroy your life. God will curse you. <coughs> you fellas, whether you're single or married, you may enjoy messing around with that woman down the road. You may have pleasure in sin for a season. <coughs> but God's going to curse you and it's going to destroy your life. Your marriage is going to fall apart. Your reputation is going to crumble. You may end up with some kind of disease. You may get someone pregnant in a wedlock. You know, you can see all of the ways that things could go wrong. And this is what we see. This is the next step. See, it doesn't stop there. This curse and why I'm talking about this and why this is so important can be found in Matthew. Jesus is speaking again. Pay attention to what he says. And then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye what? Ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. See, this cycle, this cycle of sin that I'm preaching so hard at you, this leads to hell. From Satan's own words himself, it leads to an everlasting fire. This cursed people. See, you don't want to go down this path. I said there was two, there's two paths here. You're either caught in this cycle and this is where you're heading, or you've recognized this, you've stepped out of it, but you know people who are still trapped. You know, I use the example that I love myself an awful lot. And if I fall into a fire, I'm going to get myself up real quick. Well, these people that, you know, these friends of the world that you have, that you're kind of coddling, that you're scared to offend, that you're scared because they'll persecute you or scared because they're going to say, you know, mean things or, you know, that person at your job and you're worried they're going to go tell your boss you can get fired or that person in your school and you're worried you're going to get punished there or that family member that you're scared just isn't going to talk to you anymore if they get mad and get offended and they're going to go tell the rest of the family you're just pushing Jesus on them again. Those people are heading to a fire. You can see it. You can see them walking towards it. You can see them on their phone, not paying attention with that log in front of them, ready to trip them and just watch them fall right in. What are you going to do? Are you going to stop them or are you going to let them go? Because it'd be rude to say, hey, I know you're focused on something, but I need to get your attention. Our vision statement here is to grow in Jesus and go share his good news. Okay. This pointing out cycles like this is my way as your pastor to help you grow in Jesus Christ. You need to recognize this. We need to see this. I said last week, and I'll continue to say it, we are in a spiritual warfare. We have an enemy, that old devil... Who has been using the same tactics and the same tricks for 6,000 years because he's never had to change them. And he's never had to change them because the only thing men learn from history is that men don't learn from history. He can just keep pushing the same stuff. The same way of Cain that we see in Genesis, we can see it so clearly in the world today and he just keeps deceiving us he just keeps doing it 
If you are in a war and you create a battle plan and your battle plan is successful every single time, why would you ever change your plan? You wouldn't. You're going to keep pushing the same stuff over and over and over again. And it is our job to recognize that we have an enemy, recognize that people are in danger, see the cycles that he puts us in, see the traps that he lays for us, and we can break it. We can change it. Let's see what else Cain says. God tells him, Thou art cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out the Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth. And from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. Then it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. Cain's opposition to God's punishment is, my punishment is greater than I can bear. God, that's too mean. It's too mean for God to send me to hell. It's too mean for God to curse me for that. It's too mean for God to take that away. And look at what Cain is scared of. He's scared, and he says, it's going to be too much to bear because I will not be in your presence anymore. I will be cut off from you. And death searches me. Death will find me. There's no life in this without you. This is where we're heading, spiritually speaking, us as people, as, as the world around us, this is the path that they are on. Is that they continue down this road and get to this point of God cursing them, if they are in this cycle, when they take their last breath, they're cut off. There is no life. And life is short. If any of the requests that we had earlier can be an example for you, it's that life is short. Things happen. Accidents happen. Diseases happen. Life is lost before it's even born. Life is short. And people are suffering because they're blinded. And they can't see. And the church is too worried about offending people to stand up and tell them the truth. And even us Christians, I mean, isn't this so common of us? Lord, that's too much for me to bear. God, why'd you put this on me? God, why'd you do this? I just imagine God looking at us and saying, okay, do you want me to give you what you really deserve? You'll humble yourself real quick. No, Lord, I'm okay. Thank you, Lord. I'll count my blessings, God. I want to share something else with you. If we continue to read, and Cain says it's too much for me to bear, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of thy earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. So it's not too late for Cain yet. He's still here. And even though he failed and he killed his brother, and, and even though God cursed him and he's struggling right now and God's kind of punished him here on this earth, God still gives him time. And, you know, there may have been a chance for Cain to have redemption. It's not too late. And even with all of this, what does God do? He says, And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whoever 
slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. So God put a mark on him. Now, I'll be honest. Up until preparing for this study, I always viewed this mark as a bad thing. Right? Oh, Cain, he was just full of sin. God marked him, sent him off in the world, cut him off. Well, and then it hit me that the mark is not a bad thing. The mark is God's mercy. The mark is God saying, I know you're scared. I know people are going to come after you and hurting you. And I'm, I'm announcing to the world right now, if anybody touches him, touches my child, touches this person, I will bring vengeance on them sevenfold. And I'm going to put a mark on him so people will see that they should not touch Cain. That they should not hurt that person. That is God's mercy towards Cain. And that is God giving him time in the world, hoping that maybe he will repent, that he will come back to him. That is where we are at today. Which camp are you in? Are you a Cain or are you an Abel? If you are a Cain, let this be an example to you. Read how it plays out. See the danger that's in that. And please, sacrifice the lamb. Rely on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And if you're an able, wonderful, you're dancing around filled with joy. I got the joy, joy, joy. Praise God. Don't be afraid to share his word. Don't be afraid to offend people. Don't be afraid to push people where they persecute you as long as you are doing it for righteousness sake. If you are sharing the word of God with them, it's not hate speech. If you're sharing truth with them and they get mad at you and they persecute you, guess what? They're not persecuting you. They're, they're persecuting you for Jesus' sake. And Jesus himself said, I am going to bless you for that. With all the rest of the Beatitudes, you know, blessed is the poor in spirit, blessed is the meek, you know, blessed is the merciful. All of these characteristics that God wants for you in your life, he also says, you will be persecuted. If we're not being persecuted as a church, we're failing as a church. If we're not sharing truth with people and confronting them with the word of God and telling them there's eternal hellfire waiting for you if you don't, if you don't straighten your act. Please, I, I want you to be clear. You know, I, I, was, I was just like you. I was a Cain. I was lost in the world. I was cut off from God. I, I was full of sin. I was struggling. I was hurting. I was an awful human being and an awful person. And all it did was bring destruction and pain. And nothing changed until I relied on the sacrifice of the Lamb, the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus Christ, and then that cleansed me. And now I'm full of joy. And I'm here boldly preaching to you, pleading to you, turn your life over to God. Rely on the blood of Jesus Christ. And you angels out there, don't be quiet. Continue to preach, continue to push to co-workers and, and schoolmates and family members, friends, strangers, everybody. Life is short. Don't let it go to waste. There is joy to be had in this world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. God, we thank you for not just leaving us in the way of Cain. God, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for forgiving us of these sins and helping us to recognize these cycles so we can break all of this. Lord Jesus, we thank you for just revealing to us that, yeah, this cycle is really dangerous. And it leads to us being cursed and headed towards hellfire. But it all starts if we go back 
So point one, it all starts with making a decision in our life of if we are going to follow you or if we are going to go our way and do what comes natural to us. And Lord, if we choose you, all of these steps, all of these things that we covered are just washed away. Your blood just erases them out of our life. Lord, I pray that these people will recount on your sacrifice and not their own. And God, as Christians, as your church, as we go out into the world, I pray that you will help us to shine your light. Help us to see through this trap of the world and this cycle of sin. Help us to see that sometimes we have to offend people to get through to people. And that a friend of the world is an enemy of yours. Help us to not be enemies, God. You are almighty and all-powerful. And I want you on our side. I want to draw close to you because we will fail at everything we do if it's not from you. So thank you, Jesus, for your blood. Thank you for cleansing us. And thank you for leading us. And it is in your name that we pray. Amen.